The six o'clock news starts right now. Nearly two weeks after the death of George Floyd in the custody of police in Minneapolis, protesters around the country are still gathering and still demanding change. That is certainly true as you take this live picture over downtown San Antonio tonight. These are protesters who are walking through downtown on their way to public safety headquarters. They have spent some time at the Bear County Courthouse as well. But you can see them there making their way down downtown streets. I believe that might be Travis Street on their way to public safety headquarters. Show me what community looks like. This is what community looks like. Show me what. Well, another good sized group of people on the move from the Pearl just north of downtown. In the past few days, the protesters have kind of found each other and formed one large group and then marched together. That could still happen as we go into the evening. Well, San Antonio police have identified the woman killed at a near Northside apartment on Wednesday as 39 year old April LeClaire. The case at 12 defenders confirmed the man charged with killing her was let out of jail in an unrelated case earlier this year without even having to pay bond and remained free despite repeatedly violating conditions of his release. Dylan Collier has more on what went wrong. San Antonio police late Wednesday night arrested 43 year old Thomas Roberts for murder at this West Avenue apartment complex. Officers who at first couldn't get Roberts to open the door eventually found the body of April LeClaire inside. Investigators believe the killing was domestic violence related. Court records show Roberts has nine previous convictions in Bear County, including for domestic violence and possession of an explosive weapon. Roberts was also charged in January with making a terroristic threat after telling an SAPD officer last year he wanted to purchase a handgun and shoot officers with it. A day after Roberts was charged for the alleged terroristic threat, County Magistrate Rose Zebel Sosa released him on his own recognizance. Zebel Sosa did not respond to requests for comment about that decision. In a statement issued today, Huff said judges in March were asked to not issue any warrants and to let out as many nonviolent defendants as possible due to COVID-19 concerns. Between the time Roberts was released on bond and then charged with murder, records show he violated the conditions of his release at least three times, once for a failed drug test and twice for missed appointments. Judge Yolanda Huff continued him on bond all three times. The only assurances that the judge could have had in this case would be that he's going to reoffend again in big ways. And certainly he did. Marta Prada Palaez is president and CEO of Family Violence Prevention Services. I'm appalled. I am appalled. You, you do not have to be an attorney or an officer of the law to understand what a what a misjudgment what what an opportunity wasted for the defenders Dylan call your case at 12 news now if Roberts had been rearrested for the violations there's a strong possibility he would have stayed in jail this spring since an order from Governor Greg Abbott blocked people with violent criminal histories from being eligible for PR bonds during the pandemic Meanwhile, Mayor Ron Nuremberg is assuring protesters that he will work to bring about change, telling a crowd yesterday to hold him accountable. Today, he sat down with Garrett Berger to talk about the change he's promising and how it could be brought about. In the past week, frustrated voices have filled San Antonio streets and even at city council chambers. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says the city is listening. So what we're going to be doing is working directly with the community to hear uh, some of the changes that are, are being called for, some of them we've heard before, but actually delivering that change through the channels that we know how to do. First, the mayor says the city needs a level set to determine where San Antonio police are with different policies and procedures, like use of force. I think that's a standard practice where we need to have a, a very clear understanding as a community of when force is used by uh, the police department and under what circumstances. From there, they can determine what specific changes need to happen and how. But he said the council's public safety committee can start working on areas they know need to be addressed, like the eight can't wait project, which advocates a set of policies that supporters say would significantly decrease police killings. According to the project's website, San Antonio has half of those policies already. And whatever changes are or are not made, Nuremberg says demonstrators want someone to hold responsible. And if there's frustrations about where we end up from here, 
I take that responsibility. If we want change, it has to be delivered, and that responsibility, responsibility lies with me. The mayor's office says the city council will receive a presentation on the police department at its next B session meeting on Wednesday. Downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Reformers have also focused on the current police contract and several protections it affords to officers accused of misconduct. That contract expires next fall. There will also be a new union president with the announcement of Mike Helley stepping down at the end of his term. And Mayor Nuremberg said there are discipline related issues that will need to be on the table as a city and union negotiate the next one. We are still waiting to learn the names of the family of six found dead in Stone Oak last night. Joint Base San Antonio confirming today that the man was a soldier assigned to the 470th Military Intelligence Brigade at Fort Sam Houston. They did not identify him. Officers found the bodies of the two adults and four children inside the family's vehicle in a garage on Red Willow. As Katrina Weber reports, a day of confusion for neighbors has now become one of sadness. It was a sight they couldn't miss. Still, the first time many people in this gated neighborhood noticed this crime scene yesterday morning was after a cell phone alert warning them of danger. That confused everybody. We all thought, well, what's going on? Police weren't sure at first either. Officers checking on a family on Red Willow found a note on their door, then found reason to believe there were explosives. After an all day evacuation, police gave neighbors the all clear. Then they gave the news that all was not well for the family, a couple and four children from 11 months to four years old. Six dead um, in the back of the vehicle uh, appears to be a carbon monoxide poisoning. Police have no doubt that for at least one of them, this was a suicide. Neighbors can't make sense of it. We were stunned when we heard about that. It was crazy. Yeah. Can't imagine what would have caused them to do that. It was just beyond... I can't even tell you, there's just not a word. The sense of confusion that people here felt yesterday has given way to feelings of shock and disbelief. Some are looking for ways to help everyone here deal with it. We are going to uh, get a candle ritual going. We're trying to figure out what is the best time and date. Like most people here, Rose Coben didn't know the family. They had just moved here in January. Police also are trying to learn more, including why this happened. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at six, this one may leave you shaking your head in disbelief. Scammers during the pandemic are not only targeting people like you, but someone was posing as the Archbishop of San Antonio to do it. The fake account is gone now, but Jesse de Goyado says the Archbishop is still concerned. This fraud uh, shouldn't be tolerated. Strong words from Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra after learning someone was using his name on Instagram to solicit donations. I have not asked for money, uh, and I don't have that kind of account. As said in a statement from the Archdiocese, the Archbishop does not raise money in this manner, and individuals need to exercise caution and verify the legitimacy of any appeal, especially on the internet, as scammers try to profit off the pandemic. Many people suffer the consequences of this kind of scam. It's not right. It's, it's, uh, it's against the law. The fake accounts were quickly taken down, so a spokesperson for the Archdiocese says there have been no reports yet of any victims. But if so, they're urged to contact San Antonio police. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. The march for justice in the name of George Floyd continues today in San Antonio. Our Stephen Cavazos has actually been making his way along the parade, along the march route with protesters. He joins us now live from Public Safety Headquarters. Stephen. Well, Steve, just now they just sang happy birthday to Brianna Taylor just a few moments before you just took us here. But we've been out with this crowd of people all day. And in fact, I just marched with some uh, marched halfway with them here to the public safety headquarters. And let me just say it is no easy task, especially given this heat. In fact, we've seen people out here battling that heat for the last hour. One person did require medical attention, but they do seem to be OK. But just take a look at the crowd size here at public safety headquarters right now. We've been seeing people give passionate testimonies over the last hour, but not just today. Over 
over the last seven days. Now, water is being distributed throughout this march, which is expected to continue. Uh, this is actually wrapping up here at Public Safety Headquarters, that is. Now, we have some countless signs and people who say that they are staging the courthouse in places like here, the SAPD headquarters. We just heard that there's going to be a public speak speaker coming up to the podium in just a few moments. We'll be coming up. We'll have more information coming up later tonight on the night beat. But for now, reporting live, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Stephen. While weekend closure is going to affect drivers on the city's north side, TxDOT is going to shut down the southbound lanes on Highway 281 from the Santerra Boulevard exit ramp to Donella Drive. This is going to be happening for a traffic switch that's going to start at 9 o'clock tonight and last until Monday morning at 5, although this is a shot here of 281 and 410 where things are going smoothly. Yeah. And new at six as temperatures continue to heat up. Project Cool in full effect to help seniors in the community stay cool this summer. Dozens of seniors receive 20 inch box fans today. The goal of the program is to provide 5,000 box fans as low cost and low energy means to keep seniors cool without increasing their utility bills. Project Cool organized through the city of San Antonio and various nonprofits like Catholic Charities. So it's very important to us because there's so many people in San Antonio, so many seniors who don't have, don't have access to electricity or they may have access to electricity, but they don't have enough money to actually have an air condition. So having this to them is huge because they have a way to actually try to be cooler in these summer months. The Project Cool is always looking for box fan donations. They can be dropped off at Catholic Charities at 202 West French Place Monday through Friday from 8 in the morning until 5 in the afternoon. Such an important event because there are so many families without air conditioning and certainly need it at times like this when the temperatures are this way. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important donation and it's one that could be timely as well, Katie. Yes, uh, we are getting into some of our hottest days so far this year. That's going to come early next week, but this weekend, nothing to sneeze at with high temperatures in the mid to upper 90s. Uh, when we get back in the full forecast, we're not only going to talk about the heat, but we're also going to get you an update on what's going on in the tropics with crystal ball. All that will be coming up in just a few minutes. New at six, a UT professor and pediatrician has been named one of 24 Ford Globo Fellows worldwide who will be trying to tackle an issue that has affected every city in the country this week, racial inequality. Ursula Perry shows us how her point of view comes from the unique perspective of medicine. Rachel Pearson is an MD and a PhD and now a Ford Fellowship appointee tasked with fighting inequality. That's been a huge part of the um, context of our conversations this week. Following protests as well as rioting in many cities in the U.S. and worldwide, her Ford Fellows Task Force well, we is on point, teleconferencing to discuss process. current events and solutions. It's a hard moment for so many people and people are really angry and suffering and fighting. But I do believe that out of this disruption, we can build a more equal society. Those building blocks will include understanding how medically blacks endure more disadvantages. Take the COVID-19 crisis. And how it's affecting the black community is long-standing injustice that is playing itself out in the body. So chronic stress from racism and poverty they increase the rates of heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure, the very same conditions that make you more vulnerable to coronavirus. Another inequality regarding coronavirus, black communities are losing more parents and grandparents than white communities. The Ford Foundation Fellowship is going to be addressing that need, investing $50 million in lifting up these communities over the next 10 years. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. This is a live picture from Sky 12 tonight over police safety headquarters of the protesters who continue to demand justice right outside police headquarters. Yeah, this is uh, day seven of protests. They have been largely peaceful, and we hope that is certainly the case as we roll into the evening hours. Meantime, let's turn now to weather. Katie Blake in for Adam Kasky. Katie?
It's going to be a warm evening out there, but relatively quiet weather wise. And that'll also be true as we head into the weekend. And next week, the big story is going to be some early summertime sizzle that we've got going across South Texas. Here are your observed high temperatures for today. San Antonio 91, that's spot on average for this time of year, but off to the south and to the west, closer to 100 in Carrizo Springs. You were at 97 today and right at the century mark in Del Rio. So plenty of heat and plenty of sunshine for you as we head into the weekend. Early Early next week, we could challenge some record high temperatures with numbers climbing into the triple digits and a tropics update for you. Crystal ball staying well to the east of the Texas coastline. No direct impacts are expected from this tropical storm along the Texas coast. However, that won't be the case along the Louisiana and Mississippi Gulf Coast as we get into late this weekend. So here's the latest on crystal ball finally starting to make some good movement to the north. The Yucatan uh, certainly glad this is going to get out of there here because it's been raining there <laughs> for several days. Um, maximum sustained winds now at 40 miles per hour. And here's the track from the National Hurricane Center are essentially moving due north tomorrow by Sunday afternoon. Landfall as a tropical storm could happen somewhere along the Louisiana Gulf Coast. But there will also be the heaviest rain here on the eastern side of the system. So it's going to be a portion of the Louisiana coast, but also Mississippi, potentially Alabama and the Florida Panhandle as well. Some heavy rain possible there. Texas is going to be on the western side of this tropical system. And when that happens, we are left high and dry here. A lot of sunshine, even some sinking and drier air along the western sides of these tropical systems usually allows us to really heat up. So it'll be much cooler, of course, in portions of far east Texas and the uh, southeastern United States. But here we'll be on the dry side of this system, and that means our temperatures could shoot into the triple digits Monday and Tuesday of next week as crystal ball stays to our east. So that's what's going on in the tropics. No other systems out there in the Atlantic Basin. Right now, we've got an air temperature of 90, a heat index of 95. So these yellow numbers here, that's what it feels like when you factor in the dew point. Check out Del Rio, 99 now, heat index of 103, 90 in Beeville, but it feels like 102. So a bigger spread in our air temperatures and our heat index numbers because our dew point numbers are higher down in this deeper green shade down to the southeast of San Antonio. So again, the higher your dew point numbers are, the higher that heat index will be and certainly on the coastal bend this weekend we could have some heat index readings uh, approaching 105 plus the next couple of afternoons here in san antonio i think the heat index could peak around 100 degrees saturday into sunday with air temperatures in the mid to upper 90s east winds tomorrow northeast winds on the back side of that tropical system as we get into sunday now rain chances really there's only a shot at an isolated shower or non severe storm late Saturday, and let's talk about why there's a complex of storms well to our northeast tonight that's going to die out over the next couple of hours, but the leftovers of those storms could fire up near the Houston area tomorrow afternoon during the heat of the day. So we'll have to watch that development. If some storms do develop, they're going to try to move to the east a bit closer to San Antonio late tomorrow afternoon into the evening hours. I don't think they're going to be able to make it to I-35, but we could get maybe a leftover shower uh, late tomorrow evening. So that's something we'll be watching for you during the day tomorrow. But just know there's the potential there for a short lived shower or non severe storm late Saturday. Otherwise, I don't have a chance of rain in your planning forecast. Luckily, we're doing pretty good in the rainfall department. We'll take a look at the latest drought monitor coming up next half hour, guys. All right. Thanks so much, Katie. You know, usually when the forecast shows 104 on Tuesday, you don't yeah. talk about sleds no. unless you're a football player. Larry Ramirez explains. So, you know, when the Cornerstone Christian, if they do the sled thing again, they're going to do it early in the morning. Yeah, when it's yeah. definitely yeah. much cooler. Cornerstone Christian has a sled pushing contest called the Warrior 2500. It is pretty intense. We got it. Plus, O'Connor point guard Camille Fowler held her signing party coming up. Now that the NBA Board of Governors voted to resume the season, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver compared the move to baseball, saying it's the first inning and they have a long way to go. Silver said they're still in talks with the NBA Players Association, who approved the NBA's 22-team format to complete this season, according to reports. The two sides are ready to move forward together and tip off July 31st in Orlando. While the two sides work on those plans, we do know the NBA is going to look very different at first. Obviously, the most significant changes from when we shut down are we're playing without fans. 
you know, we're playing in a central location. We're going to play on a campus where, in essence, um, the players are going to live um, and, and remain there throughout the competition. Everyone's going to be tested. We're, we're working through the logistics with the players, but most likely daily. And even though the players will be tested on a daily basis and the other participants, other than the time when the players are face-to-face on the court and an odd thing to do in the time of a virus, um, the other times we'll be re- 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 remaining or retaining certain social distancing protocols. Of the 22 teams set the play, the Spurs are tied for the fourth worst odds to win the title, according to Las Vegas. O'Connor senior point guard Camille Fowler signed with the University of Dallas yesterday. She put pen to paper in the parking lot of O'Connor High School, surrounded by her family and friends. She played on the Panthers varsity team starting her sophomore year. In June 2018, she tore her left ACL. Then in May of 2019, she tore her right ACL, both while playing basketball. She fought back from both injuries, showing heart and toughness along the way. Being brave, coming back, and not being scared of the game after I got hurt, and being really like, I guess, hope like a lot of the coaches taught me to be a leader, and I hope that's like one of my best contribute contribute. But my friends and family supported me a lot. They were really great in that they kept, they kept me positive and they kept me going, and I really love them for that. Fowler plans to major in business or nutrition. All right, we stopped by Cornerstone Christian Thursday where 48 student athletes from several sports were going through an intense workout on the football field with the sound of NASCAR blasting over the speakers. This is the uh, the Warrior Maker uh, 2500. They each have 2500 yards of uh, sled pushes and uh, you know, we we firmly believe here just like in a, in a lot of different areas of life it's mostly mental. Man, it's uh, it's grueling. I'll tell you that it's one of the hardest things I've done. And uh, you know, our coaches don't play about hard work, and uh, you know, we all just buy in and we do what we got to do to get our team successful. The body is a great tool to test the mind. In the fourth quarter of uh, important games and all games, you got to reach down. You got to find something special, and you usually realize it's not it's not something physical. It's uh, it's the will to continue. It's the will to push forward. Always moving forward with your eyes up, your shoulders thrown back. And so that's that's what this is. It, it breaks them down, and and to finish that 2,500 yards, uh, you can't help but call yourself a warrior if you cross that line. Ain't that the truth? Six lines of eight, each one doing three laps. They start off at the heaviest weight. And then the final lap is just a sled, which is around 40 pounds. Wow. But still, but by still, the time you get to the final one, legs are burning. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You got it. We'll I'm be right pass back. on that. You know, they say the younger generation is our future. It is. It's a fact. And uh, after I had a conversation with the 15 year old you're about to meet, I was okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Jace Sibley is a 15 year old from Holmes High School. And during this pandemic, he wrote a very special essay that his former journalism teacher somehow it got in front of me to my attention and I was very impressed by what he wrote and I reached out to Jason I said listen we do this thing called case at Q&A where we have a deeper discussion than we normally get to have uh, in a minute 30 packages and so Jace and his mom and dad joining us live now on zoom Jace thank you for joining us thank you for having me talk about what this essay is and what you hope to accomplish the the writing is, is simply about my experience, especially when it comes to living in America as a minority. You know, things such as how your school's different or how the neighborhood you come from is different, or even how people look at you differently. And what, what I hope comes from this is, you know, people are able to examine their lives and see how different people's upbringings are just from what their background is. And I think once you can start to realize things like that, you can start to break down a lot of the barriers that are still up in our in our society today. Yeah, I want to mention that essay is published right yeah. now on KSAT.com. That's the 
picture that you saw while Jace was talking. Yeah, and I, I found your essay, Jace, very powerful. I want to read for folks who haven't had a chance to uh, read some of it. Um, a little excerpt here. You say, what I have learned to be the hardest thing to accept about being a minority in America is that while equality is preached, I am not actually seen as equal. The American dream is complicated for me. Can you tell us more about that line and, and what you mean by that? So, you know, the bedrock of America sitting in the Constitution is things and phrases like we the people or, you know, all men are created equal. But when you look around our society today, you know, we have people who are kneeled on and, and they die. And, you know, when you look at the inequality in homes and jobs and in schools, I don't think that you can look around and say that everyone is equal. And I think that's always been hard to accept and hard to even think about because it's, you know, I'm not, people don't view me the same way as they view another kid who I've never even met. How are you feeling that? I mean, you, you gave some specific examples in the essay about how you feel the sting of racial inequality. You know, you, you talked about going to morning basketball practice. Um, so one of the things is, you know, I would go shoot in the morning, you know, probably get to school around 6.30, shoot for about an hour, and then, you know, a couple friends would, would walk to Chick-fil-A, it's, you know, right down the street from home. So one thing, I, it's, I will never forget it. We're, we're walking down the street, crossing the crosswalk to to get to Chick-fil-A and there's this this these two ladies and I I wasn't sure which way they were going at first but then they they crossed the street away from us and then and then walked across and it was one of the most painful things to think about because she wasn't okay with walking past me and my friends who who themselves are minorities and I yeah. just, I, I couldn't understand why. You, you know, you mentioned your friends there, Jace. Have you had a chance to talk to some of your friends about your essay? And if so, what was their reaction to what you wrote? Um, a lot of them were just glad that someone is able to express the way they feel too. Um, I don't think they all felt like they had the means or the ways to express themselves in a way that people would understand. And, you know, I can say I felt that way too, but I think, you know, some of the feedback from and people who have resonated with the message of this essay kind of brings a certain level of validity to how we're feeling. I want to make sure we talk to your mom and dad there, uh, Banji Wilson and Thomas Sibley. Your thoughts about what your son wrote and when he was talking about doing this, what, what what were you guys thinking? Okay. Um, well, when I first read the paper, I cried. Um, I, I never knew he saw the little things that people do, like walking across and away from him because he's, he's mixed um, or because his friends are, are Hispanic. Um, so I, I, I cried um, and we talked a lot and I'm super, super proud of him for speaking up. I think it's brave and um, I couldn't be more proud of him. And I hope that more of the younger generation starts to speak up. Thomas, how about you? I, yeah, I think I, I'd echo the same stuff. It's, 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 a, it's hard to express just how proud of him we are. Uh, he's very perceptive very observant, um, but he also works very hard. And so the effort that he has put into not only the article, but the importance that he puts into school and education is something that makes us extremely proud. I think it gives him an opportunity, hopefully to open doors that wouldn't be available to him otherwise. And, and that's the hope is that he continues to strive, push himself, and open doors that wouldn't normally be there and help create change. Now we're gonna interview you guys again uh, during the 10 o'clock news on the night beat. And I wanna 
because we're running out of time through this interview, I want to dwell deeper into the next step that you guys see. And I know that uh, at least father and son have talked about, you know, maybe what the next step should be and letting people know ways that they can help or businesses they can support and things like that. So I appreciate your time th this evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you. We'll see you guys at 10. We'll be right back. Well, it is National Donut Day today, but this year is a little bit different. It's held every year in the first Friday or on the first Friday of June. But this year, Krispy Kreme stretched it out for a whole week, giving free donuts from this past Monday through today. According to the National Day calendar, the Salvation Army created the day in 1938 to honor the women who served them to soldiers in World War One. Yeah, these ladies were called the Salvation Army lassies. They use the treats to boost the morale of the troops. Donuts come glazed, iced, cream filled, topped with just about anything you can imagine. And don't forget, there's still time to get that free donut. Those look good. They do look good. Well, today is also National Veggie Burger Day. Meatless burgers or hamburgers. Can you technically call them hamburgers if they're meatless? I don't know. Yeah. Um, they're nothing new, despite the recent buzz some companies have been getting. Before they, there were Beyond and Impossible Burgers, there were Veggie Burgers. See, I think you channeled Adam Kasky there for a second. <laughs> Maybe. Can you call them? Yeah. Besides the difference in ingredients, the Veggie Burger and the traditional Beef Burger do have a lot in common. You can grill them, fry them, bake them. The toppings the same, tomatoes, lettuce, onions, etc. National Veggie Burger Day, founded in 2017 by Amy's Kitchen, to get people to try one. Seems to be growing in popularity. Yes, indeed. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with City Cam. Very warm one out there today, Katie. Yeah, nice and warm. Spot on the average for this time of year as far as our high temperature is concerned. We made it up to 91 degrees today at the airport. We'll see those numbers climb a bit above the seasonable average over the next couple of days. And certainly by early next week, we'll be challenging some records. So 90 now, just a few fair weather clouds. We'll see skies continue to clear out this evening. It'll be in the 80s over the next several hours, but that dew point, check it out, it's near 70. So that means it is going to be muggy out there. We'll get you a look at your weekend forecast and another check of the tropics coming up in a few minutes. All right, happy Friday, everyone. Weekend's upon us. It's been a week, and so uh, I'm excited for, I don't care what the weather brings, just right. bring me the weekend. A couple days off yes. would be nice. Yes, and it's going to be a good weekend to maybe find a spot by the pool or even a sprinkler in the backyard or something like that. It's going to get toasty out there over the next few days. I do want to start off with a look at the drought monitor and our recent rains have proved beneficial. So this was last week's drought monitor. These are issued every Thursday, so this was toward the end of May. This is the drought monitor that came out yesterday, so we continue to kind of chip away at this. We've still got some spots down south of Eagle Pass, west of Catula there in the orange color, indicating severe drought still ongoing there. Um, a batch of moderate drought closer to the coastal bend as well, and then some that yellow color that's considered exceptionally dry, but compared to where we were even a month, month and a half ago, Things are looking so much better as far as the drought is concerned. The aquifer is doing well. So as we head into this very hot and dry stretch of weather, it's good that we've gotten some rain recently to kind of kick off this rain free stretch here. 90 in San Antonio feels like 95. Again, these yellow numbers are your heat index numbers or what it feels like to the body. And these can be considerably higher than the actual air temperature when you get really high dew points and our dew points are going to stay elevated through the weekend and into early next week. We've got higher numbers down near the water. That's not abnormal, but that's what pushes those heat index numbers above 105. And that's the case uh, this evening. We've got some slightly lower numbers west of 35, but everyone in muggy territory and that trend will continue through the weekend and into early next week. Now look what happens on Wednesday. We're watching a dry, cool front moving in late Tuesday into Wednesday. That could potentially really chip away at our high humidity. Air temperatures will stay high. There's, they'll still be in the 90s, but if we can get some nice dry air in place, that would really kind of um, take a little, uh, give us a little bit of relief as far as the humidity is concerned, but that is not until the middle portion of next week. In the meantime, here's a look at your weekend. 95 in the afternoon tomorrow, 97 on Sunday. Heat index in San Antonio maxing out around 100 degrees. Tomorrow could be a few degrees higher than that. Again, during the heat of the day, 
peak heating in the afternoons as we get into Sunday. Very mild mornings as well. Now, for the majority of us, the weekend is going to be rain free, but you do notice I bring in a 20% chance of a shower or non severe storm late tomorrow evening. And let's talk about why this is an interesting setup. So you look across Texas, essentially the whole state is rain and cloud cover free because we've got upper level high pressure parked to the west. A lot of sinking air here that makes it hard for even a lot of cloud cover to bubble up at times. Now that high is going to hang with us this weekend. Uh, winds around this high are counterclockwise and you'll notice farther to the east there closer to the Mississippi River. Uh, there are some thunderstorms there, a little batch of storms, and sometimes there are these disturbances that produce storms that rotate around this ridge of high pressure. So there's the potential tomorrow that a little batch of energy that could produce some storms may rotate around that high and pop up some storms near the Houston area tomorrow afternoon. We'll have to watch for that development. If those storms can develop, they will try to move southwest uh, closer to San Antonio and I-35 by late tomorrow evening. I think they're going to have a hard time holding themselves together all the way from Houston here to San Antonio, but that's why you'll see just a 20% shot at an isolated shower or non severe storm late tomorrow evening. Other than that, your forecast is rain free. Thanks in part to tropical storm Cristobal maximum sustained winds now 40 miles per hour. This is finally on the move off to the north. It'll move through the Gulf tomorrow, making landfall somewhere along the Louisiana Gulf Coast Sunday afternoon, second part of the day uh, on Sunday there or late in the morning. That'll continue to move north. We'll be on the dry side of that tropical system. System. But look at the rainfall here, uh, looking at maybe between six and 10 inches of rain there in deep south Louisiana, deep south Mississippi, and then the rain will extend off to the north. But again, we are on the dry side of that system, and it's actually going to help our temperatures to jump up into the triple digits Monday into Tuesday. We'll be challenging some record high temperatures both those days and then back to a cool 99 by Wednesday, guys. All right. Thank you. Cool. Katie. Cool. 99. Yeah. In case you missed it coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. And taking a live look at Sky 12 right now, flying over downtown where another peaceful protest is happening as we speak. Today marks the seventh day of protests here in San Antonio following the death of George Floyd. District 8 Councilman Manny Pillai is showing up to public safety headquarters where this march first started. Now the councilman addressed the crowd of people who gathered outside public safety headquarters earlier. He wanted to let them know he's heard their message and he's joined them on their march to the courthouse. You're the kind of person who needs to add the word but after Black Lives Matter. A 32-year-old woman who died in an overnight crash overnight, a horrific crash. San Antonio police say it happened along I-10 West at De Zavala Road around 3.30 this morning. They say the woman was driving the wrong way and ended up hitting a concrete median. Her SUV flipped over, it caught fire, and she was thrown from the vehicle and died at the scene. The woman is in police custody after she allegedly stabbed her boyfriend. According to the sergeant on the scene, the incident began with some sort of argument. That's when police say the woman cut the man and then stabbed him in the abdomen. The victim was taken to Bamsey in critical condition. Meanwhile, the woman has been detained by officers. New at five, more than 18,000 diapers given out to hundreds of families in the San Antonio community. The donation made as a partnership between Gun Automotive and the Texas Diaper Bank. Gun automotive workers volunteer their time to help unpack about 300 cases of diapers and hand those out to those in need in the community. Volunteers say they're glad to have this opportunity to lend a hand. News around, Amer News around America, some surprising unemployment numbers for May. The U.S. unemployment rate fell to 13.3 percent last month, and the economy gained 2.5 million jobs. In April, the unemployment rate jumped to 14.7 percent as businesses shut down during the coronavirus lockdown. Economists expect the, expected the unemployment rate to be even worse in May, rising to nearly 20 percent. But the gradual reopening of the economy added those new jobs. One of the most high-profile retailers to file for bankruptcy, planning to close more than 150 stores this summer. J.C. Penney says it expects to close 154 stores in 20 states and additional closures will be announced in the coming weeks. It's all part of its bankruptcy plan. J.C. Penney filed for Chapter 11 protection last month, but the company is struggling to overcome a mountain of debt and the effects of this pandemic. The retailer says shuttered locations will have closing sales 
that will last around three months. And not in America, but here's a rare opportunity to own your own little utopia. An entire fully functional village is up for auction in Sweden. It's located just 90 minutes north of Stockholm. The sale price, a mere seven or so million dollars. Yeah, the 62 acre village, more than 70 buildings, including a church, preschool, hotel, restaurant, spa with pool, gym, a sauna. It also has bottling operations to market its own local spring water. There's an additional 84 acres of forested landscape in continuous use as a spa town for 320 years. Its current owners bought it in the early 1990s. The deadline for bids is August 16th. I'm sure it's much cooler in Sweden. When can we get there? Yes. <laughs> Not that I'm I, with you. Not that I have $7 million, but I thought it would be more expensive than that. Yeah. Yeah. That seems kind fairly, of a bargain. So you think, it, think? You think it's a bargain <laughs> for, yeah. for the Sweden spot? Look at the fall trees there, the yeah. orange. Yeah, yeah, we are so far away from that here. In I South. just want to stay there. Yeah. But it looks cool. We don't need to buy the thing. If we all chip in, maybe not. I still yeah, don't know that no. we get that close. $95. Maybe $7. <laughs> $7. 95 tomorrow. 97 on Sunday. Slim chance of a late evening shower or storm tomorrow. We'll keep you updated. Otherwise, a rain-free forecast and even hotter early next week will challenge some record high temperatures. Thank you, Katie. And th thanks for watching the news at 6. See you on the night beat at 10.